Hello, 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 hello everyone. We are live again and today we are going to show you that it is possible to have brains and beauty at the same time because we've got the amazing Dr. Timo Tastaha and Lance Butler there from Ascent Nutrition. And we are carrying on the theme about pets and what they can teach us humans. So before we get into the nitty gritty of the subject today, how are you doing, Lance? Excellent, Catherine. Thank you very much. Um, as we were talking about prior to, I'm really looking forward to this. And I really believe that as we continue to do this, it's going to gain a lot of traction and, and momentum with people. And, uh, you know, people are going to share this widely because, you know, like the last conversation that we had was so amazing and so mind blowing. And I know all three of us learned so much from each other. And, you know, that to me is a really good indicator of not only good synergy amongst us, but uh, you know we're we're all open to new information and we're all bringing new information to the table that is you know just not not heard of often, and we can really help a lot of people and of course help the animals with this too. I so totally agree. agree. Yeah, Timo, how are you doing? Good. Um, I have some renovation projects of small old uh, furniture. And it's pain in the butt, but it's fun. <laughs> well, I'm having my kitchen done and um, I've had no water or oven or anything for a week. And they've just told me I'm not going to have it for the weekend either. But I'm still smiling. Thank goodness for all the healthy stuff I've got. So today we are starting off a new series and I am so, so excited about this. It was something I touched on on a talk that I did with um, Solutions with Aquarius Rising Africa this morning because our bodies, whether they're from our animals or from ourselves, are always giving us clues. And of course, you know, by the time a physical symptom manifests itself and shows it to ourselves, particularly when we're looking at our animals who can't necessarily talk to us and tell us the early warning signs, by the time we see the physical symptom, it's often quite well advanced. So one of the things we're going to be talking about today, and we really welcome, how lovely to see everyone in the chat, Debbie, Monique, Andrea, um, some of the other names, I don't know your name, so Mac Macaroo. Um, thanks for joining us in the chat. What we're going to be talking about today is we're going to be looking at what sort of signs our animals might be giving us that their mind or bodies or both normally are going out of balance. We'll be bringing in the link because obviously everything we're talking about for our animals equally applies to us humans and then we'll be giving some solutions about it and also hopefully answering any questions you've got along the way. Um, so this is really really important isn't it both of you because our animals are constantly trying to communicate with, ourselves, with us um, but sometimes as humans we can miss those really important signs can't we Timo? Yeah and uh, most of the communication is also uh, subconscious that means we we don't know what they try to tell us but they also don't know what they're telling us because it happens subconsciously and uh, therefore it's um it's very important to watch out every day each day to the small changes um behavioral changes physical changes postural changes and uh, especially everything that includes basic drives so for instance sexual drive is behind or hunting drive dropped or playing drive dropped or they seem to not to come close or they seem to be too cuddly and everything that is out of character it's important to watch out for these small clues each and every day yeah it really is and and this is why we encourage and back on the vibrant animal team playlist you will see one of the videos that Timo and I did a little quite a long few months ago on how to check your dog but it's so important isn't it to really get to know what is normal behavior for any of the animals in your yeah. care um not only what's normal behavior but what should be good physically because unfortunately in today's age where we're so politically correct. We're not allowed to say anyone or anything's fat. We're not allowed to make any comments or derogatory no. comments. Sometimes it can be really, really important and people can miss those, those signs. And particularly if it's your own animal and you're seeing that animal every day, you're not necessarily going to notice problems creeping up on you. So do you think a good place to start, Timo, would be for... Because obviously everything in the body is linked and today we're particularly talking about the skin... 
can you talk us through some of the things that say take a typical dog or cat that people should be checking and keeping an eye on physically and then we can talk about the behavior yeah sure first i would like to join you in um not being happy with this extreme political correctness and mm. uh, the extreme lengths of people try to discipline and how do you say it, educate you to how to behave soon we cannot even um i think we cannot even cast ourselves or you cannot say anything negative about yourself that would be discriminatory you know like oh i have to lose four pounds no you have to love yourself I'm <laughs> unconditional so it's just it goes there yeah so what do we check first of all um there is also stigma if you tell your neighbor your dog is fat that's you know you cannot do that anymore earlier you would say oh what a chubby boy and everyone would laugh and now you're like who the fuck are you and uh this this is really really getting on my nerves because it's like it just stops um evo the community from evolving right this is really bad and now we are devolving because we cannot say anything anymore Unfortunately, I am the person that does tell their neighbor their dog's too fat. <laughs> I do. And then they tell me, who are you? I say, I'm a vet. Then they don't say anything anymore. Yeah. Oh, but yes. But I do get myself into quite a bit of trouble because of it. Yeah. yeah. So what do we, do we look at? First of all, you have to be really, really uh, honest with yourself and about yourself and your pets also including horses mm -hmm. so first you have to accept the truth are they good are they bad are they big are they small are they tough are they weak are they sensitive are they ruthless are they uh bad boys a-holes are they very nice you know you, you have to accept the way they are to see changes first so is your pet is not a wish list so the pet is who it is you know it, it is and you have to accept this and once you accept it then the changes are very, very easy to pick. Um, and before we go to the physical part, I, I want to urge people to look at the typical behavioral, not behavior, maybe characteristics, let's say, because behavior is more your thing, Catherine, but the characteristics is like how your dog or cat or horse behaves normally towards you and towards others. I'm not talking about being tired, being down. I'm talking about what is the interaction level normally and what changed. And that is really hard to see from day to day. But um, sometimes uh, some people would claim that their dog is a couch potato. And I'm asking, since when? Yeah. Oh, he was, he was far happier like six months ago. So, yeah. So your dog is normally not a couch potato then. So it was moving, right? Yeah, every day we would work two hours. And what happened? Yeah, I'm working from home. So you, you are the couch potato now, not your dog. So yeah. you just steal away your dog's movement pattern, right? So this is what I try to say. It's you have to be honest with yourself and look at the dog, your cat, your horse, whoever, um, and see what patterns changed and what they are linked to because they don't change by themselves. There's always an impulse to change them. And the second thing is, of course, looking at them physically. So uh, for that, you have to cuddle them, touch them if they let you. If they don't let you, that's already a really bad sign. <laughs> so yeah. there's something wrong for a very long time, possibly. And, um, and find out heat patterns, ears, nose, dry nose, eyes, leaky eyes, leaky nose. Um, posture is super important and we will come to the um, hormonal balance later that's a very a bit deeper level so and of course you have to see how they really physically explode or not because let's face it most of the pets are carnivores hunters so they are more explosive animals they have enormous potential energy in their muscles and if they're always uh, very how do you say it slow and not explosive at all, then something is amiss or they are too old, one of the two. So you have to find out what's the reason behind it. And then, of course, watch for the skin and the, the coat. And both tells you a lot of stories. Yeah. So but before we go deeper, I would like to know as, yeah, as a typical 
um, biologists and therapists and, and specialists in, in animal behavior also, what do you see? And you, you are also um, cat and dog mama for a very long time. So what are the typical signs for you that they show when something is really wrong or starting yeah. to get wrong? Yeah, fantastic. So obviously I work with all species and I think you've covered some really important points there. So the first thing is, is to really tune in with your animals and really notice because the most times when people contact me, they're like, oh, I'm sure it's nothing but... And then the fact that it's even come to their consciousness in the first place, they know deep down there's something not right. But sometimes as, as their parent, as their animal parent, it can be really difficult for you to accept that because some people don't want to know if there's something wrong. So what I tend to find, which is really quite sad, and I will be coming to the questions, by the way, thank you for all putting your questions. We'll come to those in a minute. Is the fact is there's a lot of people Bearing in mind our animals, doesn't matter what species this is, whether it's a guinea pig, a horse, a cat, a dog, a goldfish, they are completely dependent on you, most of them, for every decision that you're taking. They're dependent on what you feed them, so whether they're getting adequate nutrition, they're depending on when you feed them, how much and what type of exercise you get, they're, um, who they're allowed to interact with, how much they're left on their own in the day, what chemicals are pumped in and on them. So the thing is, they have got to trust you. And if it's a bit like, you know, if your husband doesn't notice that you're feeling really upset, it's not good, is it? <laughs> you all know that, husbands. So the thing is, as a pet parent, it's really important you notice those subtle signs because if you don't notice it, either the physical signs or the behavioral sides are going to get much more extreme. And most people don't take action until the problem is very well developed. So by the time your dog is showing you that there's a skin issue, and obviously skin is one of the largest organs in the body, it's a reflection of what's going on inside the body. Yes, there can be some external parasites, but generally speaking, it's a reflection of what's going on inside the body and also inside the mind, because we all know a lot of people and a lot of animals express their stress through the skin. Yeah. So the main thing I would like to say is take action early without beating yourself up at all. So if you notice there's a problem, thank yourself for noticing the problem, your animal searching will, and then take action because the longer you leave it, the more difficult it is to correct those imbalances. Yeah, and one of the very good actions I would like to say is go to your vet instead of uh, asking important and deep questions on uh, YouTube as a comment. Because if something is really wrong, then uh, it needs a hands-on approach and people cannot help you really from far, far away. So if something is really bad, take your dog, cat, pet, whoever, uh, as soon as possible to the nearest veterinarian trust. Yeah, it's really important because there's some comments I get a lot below all my videos, not even just the animal ones, where people are saying really serious health conditions with their animal. And it's not appropriate to be asking questions like that in a YouTube comment. So I do respond to the emails and I had responded to the chap above many times, but the problems are so serious. So I do offer consults and I offer consults that help get animals back in balance from using a whole load of things and how to keep them there. So how to work out the root cause of the problem. But as Timo said, if, you're, if your animal's got a current health issue, you need to go and see a vet. And then once we have a diagnosis, then if you're looking for natural alternatives, I can really help you with that. So we've got a question here, a really, really, really common one from Monique. Thank you for asking this, um, Monique. Um, so she's got a dog that she's rehomed, that she's taken on, um, which is allergic to a lot of food and is now on allergenic kibble. She eats certain plant leaves. She's no clue what she's missing, thinking of using probiotics. Do you want to start with this one, Timo, or me? Yeah, actually, I would like you to start because this is... Um... Yeah, I will talk a lot about it, but I also want to include uh, Lance to this one. Yeah. Because, yeah, yeah, this is very applicable to your stuff, Lance. So I would just start off very briefly. So thank you, Monique, for noticing that. Any allergy is a sign that the body is out of balance. So personally, I don't recommend probiotics at all because probiotics that are approved for veterinary use contain only a very narrow strain of bacteria. 
And by using them, you're pushing, you can push the microbiome out of balance just as just as much by introducing a few narrow strains of probiotics as you can from um, not using them in the first place. Now, sometimes they're brilliant to use for a couple of days, but not on an ongoing basis, in my opinion. Now, what are the worst possible thing that the dog could be on is an anagenic kibble because that's going to be very highly processed and not be giving your dog the nutrients. So it's like sticking a, a sticky plaster over it. And sometimes that's important whilst you work out and heal the root cause. So what I would be recommending, Monique, is using um, some of the algae oil that we're going to come on to because this is absolutely crucial in a situation like this. And Lance will be explaining sort of why and Timo. But also I would be looking at um, removing some toxins from the dog's body as well because the toxins will massively affect the ability of your dog's microbiome to work properly, will probably be causing leaky gut, which is a classic precursor to uh, um, allergies showing up and if you don't remove those toxins then you you're going to be playing catch up so i would recommend a combination of things i mean i use the roots clean slate you can find the links under the video and i'm sure andrew who's more efficient than i am will put it in there um the ASEA is brilliant for allergies so you're welcome to contact me about both these products and lance your algae oil is going to be crucial for this isn't it yeah, absolutely. So, you know, with the algae oil, um, because it's going to elicit effects that we might call uh, anti-inflammatory or to help support a, a healthy inflammatory response, um, it's going to do a lot of different things. Now, we'll get deeper into it as it relates to the brain and nervous system and, and you know, inflammation in general. But as you talked about, Catherine, you know, with allergies, it's clear that there's something going on in the body that's not right. Uh, it's not not working the way that it should. And so if we can give an animal or, or a human, but in this case, an animal, uh, a fat that their physiology needs, like literally needs, then what we can do is we can start to tip the balance from uh, pro-inflammation to anti-inflammation. OK, and so when, once we're doing that, then a lot of things will shift in the body. And Timo's talked about this and maybe you can go a little bit deeper into this. What it's going to do, one of the things is that it's going to help uh, turn on genes, a lot of different genes in the body that help to elicit beneficial effects on a broad spectrum of different systems in the body. So it's going to help support cardiovascular health. It's going to help support skin health, like we've talked about, the brain and nervous system. And then, of course, you know, the pain and, and inflammation aspect, but going a little bit deeper with it, you know, because these omega threes for animals are so uh, crucial, uh, when we give the body something that it truly, truly needs at a fundamental level, you are going to start tipping the scales to a place where it's supporting health in a, in a more beneficial way. So the way that I like to look at it is if you can think of, you know, these omegas or these fats in the bodies, um, they're so fundamental that if we're not getting it, things start tipping out of balance. But when we start giving it in a good dosages for the respective animals, then we start to balance those scales. And it basically helps to uh, create more polarity in the body uh, in a way where there's more electricity is going to be uh, conductive in the body. And it's going to then just help life flow better. And so there's a lot of more specific things like it's going to help mitochondrial health. It's going to help the cells because uh, this DHA and, you know, a little bit of the EPA, it's needed to help the cellular membranes stay fluid and flexible and for them to be able to move and, and communicate and allow uh, nutrients in and, you know, uh, prevent certain toxins from getting in. So, you know, again, it's like at a root fundamental level of what DHA and, and these omega-3s do for pets and, of course, for humans. Um, and so it's, it's just one of those things where if we can address the root uh, from a nutritional standpoint, then we really can influence so many different genes in the body and then so many different systems in the body for the animal. Brilliant. Great. Uh, Monique also adds, I also think there was a lot of stress involved to mm. her message. So, of course, this is a dog that changed its home. I understand that. Uh, and uh, most of the dogs eat the same food most of their life. 
in the same flavor and the same type. And when they have a leaky gut, uh, or even not a leaky gut, they might create a lot of, uh, or they might develop a lot of allergies to this type of protein source, especially if it's uh, incorporated with highly processed uh, starches. So uh, what happens though is, although this is not, how do you say, it, not very common, um, if you drop those uh, proteins for a very long time and then rebalance the body with natural food, some of those allergies just disappear. But some of these allergies are genetically, uh, how do you say it, imprinted, and uh, they will always manifest. For instance, 28% of everyone in the world is allergic to soy protein if it's raw. So you cannot change it. It has nothing to do with healthy or unhealthy lifestyle. It's a genetic thing. But um, a lot of allergies that dogs develop are not genetic. They are mostly to certain type of proteins and certain type of starches and combination of things. And, uh, and leaky gut, I must say, is one of the most known uh, causes for it. Because then big chunks of original uh, protein, animal protein, leaks into the blood when it shouldn't because it has to be digested beforehand. But high starch in the um, food makes it impossible for your for the stomach to break down all the proteins properly. So big chunks of original protein, animal, foreign protein, leaks into the um, digestive tract and the blood and the bloodstream. So there is an immune reaction to this alien protein, and then it's imprinted in the daily life. So every time this alien protein comes into play then the body reacts to it, shows signs of inflammation, redness, itching, and the skin is screaming, this is an alien. We won't want to have this here. And this is what your pet trying to tell you with getting red and itchy and, and unhappy. The skin is communicating to the brain of the dog. This is not right. Drop it. But because they cannot decide, we feed them. We have to understand it and we have to drop it as you do right now. The problem is, Monique, um, if you have um, anti-allergic food, they are mostly hydrolyzed protein. It's highly, highly processed protein that doesn't resemble anything anymore. And that might be a short-term solution, but on the long term, that's definitely not the right solution. So what you have to do is you have to experiment around, find a protein source, raw or very mildly cooked, as we have it on our... Um, uh, dog and cat feeding courses, follow the course, try to find out which protein you can use for a while and go from there, bring back the uh, balance, add algae oil and try to realign the immune reactions to the daily life, right? And toxins, of course, I don't want to go there. That's really, uh, Catherine said it already very well. Um, but yeah. Food is yeah. mostly the, the most core thing to correct. And, um, and going more processed is mostly not the solution. Yeah, it's difficult for you because that's what's normally recommended. So Andrea, who is brilliant, thank you so much, Andrea, for putting the links. Below this video and also in the comments, you will find the link to the dog and cat nutrition course that Timo and I have done. It's really easy to follow. It's very comprehensive. You've got recipes in there. You've got do's and don'ts. And we are just as we speak making an extra module to go in there about bones and about the algae oil. Because when Timo and I wrote the course, we didn't have access to the algae oil. So you'll get those free modules and anyone who's got the course automatically yeah. gets the updates for free. Yeah. So um, a very quick question from May. Why your cat prefers to be outside rather than air conditioned rooms? Um, Can I answer that? Please do. Yeah, I'm the same. I also prefer to be outside than the air-conditioned room. Not important how hot. And the reason for that is I feel better outside. Your cat is a hunter. And uh, your cat might like to have the overview and the absolute control of its own um, environment. Maybe it's very attentive to what's happening around and likes to be always on top of its game. Not just the comfort part. And don't forget your do uh, dog and cat have their own air conditioning and uh, they are happy happy that way so yeah that's the answer there's nothing special about it it's just your air conditioned uh, room is highly possible not very attractive for your cat 
And it's a very unnatural environment, isn't it? And yeah, quite, that's what it? I want to say. So it's like yeah. for a for a true hunter, what do you want to do in an air conditioned room that is all plastic, wood, uh, paint, polyurethane? So what do you want to do there? <laughs> Clever cat. The best thing is is let your cat make its own mind up. It's great that you're giving it the choice, but if it chooses, let it respect that. That's great. Um, so we've got a question here from Sherry, um, which we'll, we can all dip into. Arthritis in her dog's hip and a small growth on the lower eyelid. Now, obviously, we can't diagnose anything over here, but we've got some suggestions for that. Do, do you want to start with that one, Timo? Yes. Uh, well, if the hip has arthritis, uh, that's a typical sign of one of the two things. One, um, the nutrition is totally out of whack. And two, the movement is out of whack. So I don't know how old this dog is, and uh, but that's typical. The growth on the uh, lower eyelid is to totally the vet has to check. This is we can say nothing about it, so it's impossible to say anything from here. But yeah, yeah arthritis is a typical sign of uh, imbalance in nutrients and uh, and the movement patterns. So I would recommend. Have a look at our dog nutrition course. It's very, very, very cost effective. Really, really tells you everything you need to know. Definitely, again, the algal will help. The link to that is below because for all the reasons, there's the whether the condition presents itself as skin conditions or arthritis, the root causes are generally the same. Toxicity, lack of proper nutrients to allow the body to heal, um and um and, and therefore inappropriate inflammation now obviously with arthritis as timo said there could actually be a structural imbalance and with dogs it's very very common because of leads of harnesses of pulling in the wrong areas so i would find a really good mctimony chiropractor and get your dog checked out by that as well yeah also um most of us don't think about it but dogs have to climb slippery for them mm -hmm. of course slippery chairs uh, stairs and um, have to get in, get out of slip, yeah, very slippery surfaces, especially wooden surfaces and stone surfaces. And, and, and so that means most of the time we don't think about those things, but dogs have to overcome a lot of small obstacles because they are not made to our own, for our own environment. We have shoes mm -hmm. for that and they don't. So, yeah. Okay, great. So um, the flea and tick, it's really a sort of separate issue, but the, avoid the harmful chemicals at all costs. Only use them when you absolutely have to, as in when all else has failed. Um, and really, the thing is, the options available in each co country are very, very different. So, um, you know, there's there's herbs that you can add to their feed that can be very, very effective. Again, I would definitely add the algae oil because that will help bring in a normal inflammatory response and heal at a cellular level and so make them. I've noticed my two Romanian dogs on the sofa behind, um, they're on a really good diet, but they still react really badly to insect bites and fleas. And we're on sand, so there's a lot of fleas around. Um, and I've noticed a big improvement in their skin since I've started them on the algae oil. So have a look um, in, I would, you know, literally internet search for that in terms of natural flea and tick prevention, because the options available to you would be very different depending on what country you're in. The one thing I would say, even if it says natural, read the ingredients list carefully. And if necessary, do an internet search on those, because a lot of things say natural and then they've got some quite nasty chemicals in. Um Cats, you have to be really, really careful. What I use for my cats is a combination of DE, diatomous earth, green clay and neem powder. And I mix it together in a powder and then I apply that every couple of days and rub it into their skin because you have to be very careful for applying any essential oils to cats. Um, so we've got this is a really... Um, classic one and ties in a lot guys to what we've just talked about so nicole has got two chihuahua uh, jack russell mixes good health um they kitty quitting quit eating any kibble sensible dogs but the boy pup has started chewing his paws that's a real sign of of skin issues but skin paw chewing and ear issues are all the links so yep. really same advice as we gave the first person isn't it timo and lance yeah 
exactly the same, Nicole. You need to look at the diet because even though you've prepared your food, make sure it's balanced. So you'll learn everything you need to know in our dog course. Definitely add in the algae oil because there's an, uh, an issue there and you might, if that doesn't resolve it, need to look at some toxin removal with something like the clean slate. Um, we've got some great questions here. Thank you so much, everyone, for asking all your questions. My little dog gets free range chicken and steaks for his diet. He won't eat the good mix I got for him. What other nutrients? I mean, it's a bit long to explain, isn't it, Timo? Yeah, so first of all, I can tell you immediately, silica, vitamin D, uh, vitamin A, uh, calcium, they're all missing right now because the free-range chicken doesn't have it and the steak doesn't have it either. So um, I would recommend just check the course I, because it's, I mean, of course, it's annoying for us to tell you check the course, but it's so deep uh, mm -hmm. and so much inside. It's impossible just to tell you all of it right now. It would take two hours and we have some PDFs there that's also helpful. So, but yeah, um, dogs need 3% of their diet as fiber. So you have to somehow make it happen. If not, the gut bacteria will totally tip to the unfavorable ones over time and you will have problems with it. And, um, but yeah, check the course. And you will also find, if you go onto my YouTube channel, which you obviously know how to find because you're here, um, but there's a playlist. Now, if you don't know how to use playlists, click on the playlist button at the top and you'll find one which says animals. Timo and I, over the last year, have done a lot of videos on proteins for dogs, carbohydrates, fats, a lot of free information there. And we've also done quite a few videos, both myself and Lance separately and the three of us together. So if you also look at the videos with Lance in, where we go into in a lot more detail than we can do today, exactly how the algae oil really helps with all these issues because it really heals at a cellular level for every area of the body that, that needs it. So um, I'm so sorry to hear this, Farhat. That's very, very sad and really hard for you to go through. I mean, obviously, cancer is a huge, huge topic and there's lots of um, root causes of it. But have you got any comments on this, Timo? Yeah, I, I would like to, of course, explain how cancer happens right now, but that would take very long time. I just want to say that uh, bone cancer is not uncommon and it happens to dogs a lot because most of the dogs are eating uh, stuff with a lot of growth factors in them and growth factors are very good to, for growth but they're also very good for the cancer growth they're uh, pushing the cancer growth and highly processed food is also uh, pushing it forward especially sugars and high starches high starch foods are pushing cancer growth immensely so that's one of the reasons feeding them with stuff that they shouldn't eat I mean. yeah um, so what I would say for the cancer, it's something we will probably cover more in a future series because it's all linked. Every, the thing is, when you realise that everything is linked to toxicity, are you getting the right species appropriate condition without all the nasties in it as well? Um, then if, how that manifests in the individual person or an animal is um, it depends on their own individual constitutional strengths and weaknesses. So the same root cause factors will manifest themselves in a lot of these different diseases that you're seeing. So this is why we really, really stress the nutrition. And Timo and I, that course is, I'm not just saying it because we did it, it's so comprehensive and it really, but easy to understand. And it gives you very clear do and don'ts. And we've got three new modules. We are literally just adding that anyone who's already got the course or buys it in the future will get. One is where Timo and Lance explain in a lot more detail how and why the algae oil can help and how you can use that for dogs in the dog course and perhaps for the cat course. Another one is where Timo and I explain about the bones and then I will be adding another module about, you know, how to get some of the toxins out and some jokes and just for that to do it safely, because that's really important. So that's really going to give you. And Nicole, in terms of baby carrots, cucumbers, all those cashews, mini bell pepper, you've still got to make sure it's balanced, hasn't she, Tina? Well, actually, except cashews, the list is not very bad. Um, and cashews are not really bad, but they're also not very good because you have to highly process them to be made edible. Normally, the plant is toxic itself. You just touch it with a glove. 
So, but the rest is not too bad. I just don't understand the snack part. So these are all, uh, yeah, good ingredients to eat. So, um, except by the way, eggs, if they are not uh, organic, stay away. So that's really a big no, no, because that's the most, one of the most toxic things out there, farmed fish. Um, but yeah, you can. Yeah, and um, one of the things I would say that we cover in the course, but we've also covered in some of our videos, the free videos on the playlist, is when you feed your dogs and cats is really, really important because a lot of people cause a lot of problems. I'm not sure what that feedback is. Can anyone else hear that awful feedback? Perhaps whoever's not speaking, we can mute ourselves because that's too of the feedback. I can hear it too. I'm not sure what it is. But I, think I can only hear the feedback from you. Catherine. Uh, well, I, I think what happens with StreamYard, sorry about that, folks. There's a weird thing with StreamYard that sometimes it gives feedback between the speakers. So the easiest way is we just mute ourselves when we're not speaking. Um, yeah, so one of the problems is, is when you're giving lots of snacks to your animals, it can uh, uh, just cause a lot of problems to the digestive system. So again, that's really explained in the course. And every single client I speak to has no idea about that with dogs and the difference about knowing when to feed their dogs and when to feed their cats. So it's really, really important knowledge. Um, so in terms of sort of m moving forward, one of the key nutrients... Um, Timo, do you want to start by um, just reiterating to people why the deficiency in some of the essential oils is so, so common at the moment in dogs and cats and, and all animals? All right. So first of all, processed food um, has to be mostly kibble, uh, has to be heated to a certain level to function or to form. And, and that's the temperature where most of the fats already um, get oxidated and totally destroyed. And omega-3 fatty acids are destroyed so easily with high temperature that most of the time your dogs and cats do not get enough essential fatty acids at all. Like they are getting it, but in a form that they cannot use it anymore, not functional anymore. And on top of that, they are also getting extremely um, processed animal fat which is highly toxic in the intestinal tract. So they are getting fats they cannot process. And through that, they're also not getting the fats that would protect them against the effects of the fats they are getting. Does it make sense? It's just, it's a, it's a ridiculous statement, but that's, that's true. So um, that's why it's so important because structurally they need those fatty acids, they are essential. And uh, they also need them to function and protect themselves against uh, external uh, threats, health threats. But if we destroy them all the time before we feed them, how, what's the, uh, they cannot uh, protect themselves, right? That's why it's super important. And second thing is, uh, those fats are not just the building blocks, they are also signaling um, chemicals and have regulatory um, effects on the hormones, on mood, on so many levels and immune system. So when they're not there, nothing really functions anymore, 100%. You're muted, I guess. I was muted. Have you got anything you want to add to that, Lance? Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, just kind of to echo what Timo said with those essential fatty acids uh, and, you, you know, you said it correct, Timo, and like very well that, you know, those fats that are, you know, causing the inflammation, uh, the counter to that is fats that do do the counter. So, you know, the essential fatty acids, meaning essential that we we as humans and, and uh, animals have to get them in their diet. So that's why they're called essential. And so getting them in the diet, it's going to do just that. It's going to support a healthy inflammatory response, support what the body naturally wants to do. You know, we need, and, and us humans and pets need inflammation in small amounts, of course, but we need to balance that to make sure that it doesn't get excessive because when it gets excessive, that's what then leads to, you know, gene activation in negative ways. And then it elicits all the different effects that we've been talking about. So again, it's just bringing things back in balance and 
going back to kind of what I said earlier, these fats are fundamental to the physiology of pets and humans that we have to get them in. And so when we do, the body will respond. Now, of course, fats can take some time to actually elicit effects, but for some, it can be rather quick. So it really just depends on on your pet's uh, diet, their lifestyle, uh, what their genetics are, uh, their environment, of course. Uh, and then, you know, lastly, what they're eating and what they're getting in their diet. That's great. Thank you. Now, this is an important question from Lynn um, about how to break down and prevent bladder stones in the dog. Um, she's had a protocol that's worked for a number of years, but needs to look at it. All right. So this is actually a very, very good uh, question. And that's uh, also that applies to the cats. So stones in the, um, in the body happen when minerals that have to be uh, uh, disposed of uh, do not getting disposed of properly and acids too. In case of um, kidney and bladder, this is mostly connected um, to the uric acid because cats and dogs are carnivores. So they are eating a lot of protein. They're utilizing protein as a, as a um, uh, source for energy. And when you do that, you, you, you create nitrogen and the nitrogen is released and you have to get rid of the nitrogen. So you create uric acid and urine. And uh, to do that though, um, that those have to be bound to different um, uh, minerals. And if this is not in balance, then you will get those stones. So not to have those stones, you have to feed your cat and dog according to their own physiology. So uh, one of the main things you have to do is they have to get their minerals in the form their body accepts, not just uh, in the form that uh, your pet food producer decided to put in. And uh, they have to get their fats and, um, and B12 uh, sources properly so that these things function properly and do not cause, um, how do you say it, imbalance in the energy structure. And when the in, uh, energy structure is imbalanced, um, then most of the time, uh, the mineral balance helps to keep the urine in a flat level at pH around five, and then you avoid the stones. One of the other reasons is also, of course, uh, high phosphate based, uh, phosphorus based food. And that's also a big problem because for each um, unit of phosphorus, you need one unit, you need one unit of calcium to get rid of. And then you start to extract a lot of calcium from the body. And then other minerals jump in like magnesium, potassium, um, iron, and they start to connect together with phosphorus and other things. And then you start to get all these stones. So, and, and sand. So uh, long story short, you have to feed them the way they want to eat or their body wants to eat, and then it will function. And if you want to feed them the way you want and or your uh, food producer decides, then things will happen. And this is why I love working so much with, um, you know, your products, Lance, all of your range of products, because the quality of what you're giving in supplements and food is so important. Now, Timo, in one of our Vibrant Animal Team videos, free on YouTube, we did a whole video on the dangers of synthetics. Um, and, um, you know, synthetic vitamins and minerals are not recognized by the body in the same way and can cause all sorts of problems. So using products and supplements, food and, and supplements, which are 100 percent natural, is absolutely crucial to getting the results you want. So that's really, um, really, really important. So, Lance, do you want to talk? Oh, hang on. We've got one more one more question. And then we've got, I want to talk through the quality issues because um, I'm noticing the time. So we've got Angela here, 12 year old beagle um, prone to UTIs. Timo, do you want to have a word on that? Timo, you're muted. That's the exact same issue we talked about. Just this yeah. is urinary tract issues. It's like 
um, imbalanced um, acidity, imbalanced uh, uric acid and phosphorus content. It's the same. So it's not normally not a bacterial problem. It's, it's mostly an imbalance of the urinary tract and uh, its own um, balance with phosphorus and uric acid and all the stuff. Exactly the same thing we talked about just a second ago. Yeah, so if you miss that, do feel free to go back and re-listen to it afterwards and make some notes because it's it's really, really important. So I wanted to have a quick word now, Lance. I just wanted to go through about... Um, We've, we've spoken a lot about how essential the DHA is and the algae oil. Can you talk us through some of the quality issues? Because there's a lot of confusion out there for people, isn't there, about what they're looking for when they're buying a product? Yeah, absolutely, Catherine. So I'll kind of start at the, the beginning of the story, but quickly get to, you know, the, the, the juice of this. So, you know, a lot of people know uh, that fish oil or cod liver oil uh, has been or can be in some ways beneficial for pets and they've given them to pets. But along with that is the major issue of the toxicity. So pesticides, um, the all the heavy metals, um, you know, mercury is particularly uh, one big issue, PCBs uh, in the water. Um, Timo and I were talking last time, particularly about farmed fish. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you're getting if you're getting food where these fish are being farmed, the water is so contaminated with pesticides, you know, uh, different runoff. It depends where that facility is. Um, and just all these different neurotoxins that can get in that water. And then of course it's getting right into the fish. So then when that fish oil is extracted, those extraction processes are not only environmentally wasteful and there's so much energy use that we can literally just bypass. Uh, we, we then introduce those nauseous chemicals and those toxins into the oil, which then our pets consume. And so going to the, the, the base root of all this is, okay, these omega-3s and these fatty acids, where do they actually come from? They don't come from the fish. You know, we've been told that there's such a huge marketing campaign around the world of, you know, why fish oils can be beneficial, but it's not the fish oil it's the algae that the fish eat, which then are incorporated into the fish. And then, you know, those oils are squeezed and pressed out and extracted through, you know, different methods. Uh, hexane being one of them. Uh, I know Timo knows, you know, even more about that with, with these processes. But um, again, we can just go to the source. So we can bypass all of the fish oil industry and just go to what the the pets and us humans actually need, which is the algae that produces the DHA and the EPA and all, all these other uh, fatty acids that we need, these essential fatty acids. And so what we've done, Catherine, is we're taking the algae, so we're going to the source, and then we are uh, extracting these fatty acids through a water-based extraction. And um, this is very unique in the industry. Almost all other companies are using hexane as an extraction uh, and even algae oil products, they're using hexane. And so if you look at other companies for algae oil, a lot of them will have mixed in other plant oils and then the DHA to EPA ratio actually gets thrown way off. And the reason that happens is because of that process to extract uh, those ratios g get messed up and thrown off. And so not only do we have this clean water-based extraction that's just producing this beautiful, amazing golden oil, we keep it in its natural ratio of DHA to EPA and you know the other fatty acids that are in there. So again, you want the clean, pure source. You want it to be extracted in a way that's clean. And then you want to make sure the uh, the strain is not screwed up in a way where uh, the ratios are out of balance because this is sort of the whole point of what we've been talking about with the omega threes and the fatty acids. You know, we need uh, the, the pets and, and us humans. We need omega sixes in, in some ways, but we also need the omega threes. We need the balance. And so again, if we can get the product that's in its natural. Uh, it's natural balance, it's natural ratio of these fatty acids, then we're going to give the body, both humans and pets, the best chance to actually feel the supportive health effects. Brilliant. 
that's great um so to, yeah it, it, it's, it's so so important because there's so many toxins being introduced to us and our animals anyway you don't want to be adding something good to their diet that's actually introducing more toxins and unfortunately i see this the whole time you know so many people give their dogs and cats fish oil and it's so so damaging so um now just a couple more questions timo do you want to have a, a little answer and then i'll add a few bits to um the one on the screen okay this one is hard to answer because we don't know what those lumps are uh where they are what they are made out of how they feel how they touch a vet is far better to check that that is locally available who can touch it test it see it if necessary take a sample out of it and tell what actually that is and then the prevention depends on what they are so it's hard to say anything from here yeah it's really really important it's really good you've noticed them but you must must get those checked and see um and i would definitely as a priority be having a look at your dog's diet as well um really really essential couple more quick questions um ph balance do animals have to be have ph balance like humans yeah actually they do but uh, we are talking about urine and not blood so the blood ph is um is regulated through your oxygen and carbon dioxide balance but that doesn't apply to the to your um kidneys because they have to get rid of something that's in you and they are not regulating the um, ph accordingly they just get rid of everything that there is and if they cannot get rid of it properly then uh, the, the ph in the urine is of course changing but the blood is uh, controlled mostly by your lungs oxygen and carbon dioxide levels so it's not uh, the it's not kidney's job to do that yeah great um angel warriors um been feeding her bull chicken breast and some fish oil and then asking is krill oil a little better well chicken and oil is not balanced chicken uh, um boiled chicken breast and then some fish oil is not balanced at all so again i'm going to refer you back to our dog nutrition days so that will give your dog major major problems if that's a long-term diet for them so please please do have a look at that because um uh, um it's so so important your dog gets the right balance you know that's that's not a balanced meal yeah we have two more from freedom warrior 221 and healing light i would like to answer those two uh are they quite far up because i'm not seeing those yeah it's 0427 is asked um you guys i'd like to just chime in real quick on the previous question about krill oil just to kind yeah. of touch on that that you know, krill oil, is it better than fish oil? Well, it, it depends on a lot of factors. There's no clear answer. But again, the krill are eating the algae. So it's not any fish. It's not any, um, you know, sort of species like that that's producing the the uh, the omegas and these fatty acids. Again, it's the algae. The, the algae is the bottom of the food chain on this planet. And that's where life has spawned from in some ways or it's, it's uh, you know, grown in that way. So, you know, krill, fish oil, again, that's that's second in the ladder. If we want to go to the source, just go to the source, which is algae. Yeah. And now, Timo, you'll have to read those questions out because I can't see okay. any questions. So, from Healing Light says, I have an 18-month-old female German shepherd, and there is a neighbor's male, three years old German shepherd she plays with. The owner wants to mate them, but the others don't recommend it. Would it harm her? Yeah, with 18 months, she definitely can. But I don't know why you or the owner of the uh, or the neighbor try to decide if they want to mate or not. <laughs> Maybe first you let them uh, decide if they want to mate or not. 18 months is surely not too young. Uh, it will not hurt. It could go even earlier. But yeah, slightly later is better. But it doesn't mean that it's bad. So she is mature through and through for giving birth. It's not too early. And the second one is Freedom Warrior 221. She has a Berna Zenenhund. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. Uh, he has dysplasia in his right front elbow. What do you recommend? I prefer natural homeopathic remedies to imagine. Yeah. So first of all, you have to find out how this dysplasia is. So that means the vet 
or the specialist have to look at it and tell you how bad it is and what happened there. So why it is there. Dysplasia is mostly a structural thing. So it's you cannot just change structural things with homeopathy so easily. There might some, of course, you might alleviate some problems, but you cannot change the physical form of it. So it's, it's a deeper problem than just a chemical problem. And um, But ask your vet or find someone that you really trust in that regard and show the x-rays and then or MRIs or discuss from there. Because without seeing it, it's impossible to say anything. But it is absolutely crucial, I would just add to that, um, that you're looking at the diet. Because again, I've seen so many structural issues massively improve if you look at what's in the diet. Obviously, that's not the only factor, as Timo said, but it's absolutely essential, particularly for a dog of that size, that it's getting the right nutrients for healthy development and the right exercise as well. Yeah, sure. Movement patterns, I would like to say, not just exercise, but movement patterns. You have to check if your dog is getting into the car, out of the car, going up the stairs, downstairs, uh, running after the kids, uh, uphill, downhill, all that stuff. And Bernard Zenhund is a very strong dog, and they, they are normally living in the mountains anyway, but it's still a heavy dog. So if one of the structures are weak, it will show itself quite quickly because there's extra weight. And when a dog lands on one arm, its whole body weights nine times uh, pressure will be on one joint only. So think about that. Yeah. So brilliant, brilliant questions um, from our audience today. Thank you so much, everyone that's participated and asked such great questions. Um, we really appreciate that because everyone um who's um asking a question everyone else is going to benefit from that so thank you so much lance and dr timo for joining us let's start with you lance if you've got anything else that you want to say before we close off today um yeah just one last little thing and it's you know i think most pets are getting some form of grounding or earthing uh but you know there are pets of course that are just straight indoors and kind of like we were talking about with the porch um earlier and being outside if you can like even if you have an indoor animal buy some sort of earthing mat or earthing sheet that you can plug into the outlet the the grounding part of it to where then the the, the pets can lay on that because we're naturally supposed to be connected to the earth humans and animals and getting those negative ions and those electrons in the body is so important for really everything that it's something that can be easily over missed if you have indoor pets. Um, you know, they need to be connected to the earth. So you can buy earthing sheets or grounding sheets, and those can really help. And then, of course, getting them outside as much as you can so that they can touch the earth with their, their paws, uh, super important. Yeah, also smell. For instance, horses, uh, one of the main things that nobody really talks about is the main source of B12 for horses is smelling manure from other horses it's like we, without them connected to the soil they they cannot get their nutrients not just eating i mean just by breathing in so that's that's really um, crucial absolutely crucial and that and and they get so much information from sniffing um the feces which will put them at ease because they're reading their whole environment for that as well so it's like a uh, the best information booklet that they can be getting. Um, I would like to thank Andrea for being so helpful as always in the chat and putting all the links. We really appreciate you, Andrea. Thank you so much. I'd like to thank everyone who's contributed. Um, please do check out the other videos on YouTube with us all. You'll find much more detail in all of them covering slightly different ones. And all the links to everything we've talked about are always in the click down description box under the video and we will be back in a couple of weeks time to continue this discussion so thank you all for joining us thanks lance thanks timo thanks catherine thanks timo it was a pleasure see you again thank you all bye bye